All right. Um, uh, question number one, how long did it take God to create the world? Uh, what does Genesis 1 teach us about this? Safe to say six days. What do we mean by a day? So I'm, I think there's variables. So you, you take the position that you want to take on that. Uh, my position is there's a lot of latitude there, whether it's a young earth or an old earth, whether these days are 24-hour periods or they are epics or eons or, or whether or not God created everything in a, a split second. He spoke and it was done, which was Augustine's view. And that these, this is a literary device that we have in Genesis 1 uh, in order to set this forth in a very borderline poetic kind of way, the fact of God creating the heavens and the earth. All right, what does the doctrine of creation teach us about God? Uh, what does it teach us about humanity? Yes, and I, 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 I just, uh, can, uh, all of that, all of that. And I encourage you to keep coming back to the, the goodness, wisdom, and power as the three, three great categories um, that, that sum up what, what we can know about God just through uh, creation. So what do we know about humanity? Yeah, I mean, we can just start rattling off the stuff, can't we? We're dependent. Um, we're, made, we're made in his image and therefore unique, distinct among all of the creatures of greater value and dignity and worth uh, than any other species, uh, any other entity whatsoever. Uh, accountable, responsible. Um, it uh, really is the beginning of our evangelism is that you are made in the image of God, you are made for God, you know, what life is all about, why we're here, uh, where we came from, where we're going, everything, the fundamental things about ourselves are tied into the doctrine of creation. We're not here by chance, we're not just a product of blind forces, uh, we are a, the special creation of God, and therefore we answer to him. We're meant to worship him and serve him and please him and honor him that's what life is all about. Uh, he placed us here. Um, we are to serve him. And uh, one, one day we will go to him. So it's, um, it's really, really fundamental. And when we're doing evangelism, uh, what evangelism really does begin with God has made you and he, he calls you to serve him and obey him. And you are not. And so you are in trouble. All right. Right from the start, pretty frail and very easily influenced by outside extraneous, unimportant things. Yes, yes, fallen humanity, yes, absolutely. Okay, what do we mean by providence? It's the word that we use for what? God's work in preserving and governing all the creatures and, and their actions. Right, preserving, directing, governing all the creatures and all their actions. So it's, a, it's a, the word that we use for God governing the world. Um, how many wills does God have? In what sense should we speak of the will of God? One. He, he God has one will, but there are two, two senses. Right, so two prop, really, I'm arguing, I believe the confession puts forward two proper senses in which to speak of the will of God. They are his Creative. preceptive, Creative. which is what? His laws and commands. His commands. So it's preceptive will, and then uh, what is the other? Decretive. Decretive. Um, what he determines. And I am, tr uh, I am arguing that we should invalidate this um, sense of permissive, except, except that the confession speaks of not bare permission. So it sort of invalidates the whole concept. Permissive in, in the sense that, that uh, um, or, 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 or worse yet, perfect. So that uh, we talked yesterday about we lining up our options. I can marry person A, person B, or person C. 
and uh, I need to find God's perfect will. All three of them are Christians. All three, three of them are devout. All three of them are, seem suited. Um, but I need to find God's perfect will. And if I don't, he may permit me to do something that really is going to be destructive. Even though the choice I make between person A, person B, person B, that the choice is, uh, is not constrained by anything he commands. I'm saying this, se this sense of, uh, of the will of God is destructive of Christian liberty. It vanishes and it puts, it paralyzes believers. Yes? If you find that at all in the, in the counseling room, I, I married the wrong person. Um, God's will for me is, was not that what I chose, and yeah. so... Yeah, well, so my answer to that is it may, maybe that's so, but once you did, it was. It, it then went over. It then, maybe you violated this one, but now you are under this one. And uh, you better make the best of it. Um, so, yes, you are free to marry person A, person B, or person C if they are in the Lord. And then it's a matter of Christian liberty. What do, you, what do you feel like best? God gives you that liberty, that freedom. That's all 1 Corinthians 7. You want to marry? Marry. You don't want to marry? Don't marry. It's up to you. You, you make the call. So that's freedom. That's what Christian freedom is about. You want to take job A, job B? You want to live in town A, town B? Um, you know, you're, you're, you're to choose wisely. You're to weigh, you know, I think when you choose a place to live, you ought to choose a place to live where there's a good church. I think it'd be disastrous for you and your family in the future if you decide to lose live somewhere where there isn't a decent congregation anywhere. So I wouldn't advise that, but, uh, so wisdom guides these decisions, but, you know, within the precepts of God, the commands of God, the word of God, the ideals of scripture, there's, a, there's latitude and freedom for us to make decisions. Yes? What's the difference between a decree and a command? Um, decree is what God has determined will take place. Uh, it is all, it encompasses all the events of history, whatsoever comes to pass. That is what the decree encompasses. The commands are um, those principles that are govern our lives. So, so we don't really bother ourselves with the decretive will of God because that's going to happen. There's no stopping that. So we're not, those are the secret things that belong to God. We don't really concern ourselves with that, except we know that as, as life unfolds, it happens, things that happen happen by the hand of God, and I'm comforted by that. Yes? So you're saying we are outside the will of God when we break the commands or we violate the, per, the perceptive will. Yes. Yes. And what was wrong with the perfect will of God that is his and his triune group will and the revealed will of God. Uh, well, if you want to call, I'll talk about a perfect will of God, it's the, one he re it's the revealed will. And you could say that the creative will is perfect because the per God is working out his plan and it's a perfect plan. But to say that there's this perfect plan that's outside of what's commanded and what is determined is again to go on a wild oh. goose got wild goose yeah, chase. There, there was, okay. I remember being taught that it was like a hierarchy. You have God's perfect will for you. Then you have his permissive will. And then you can be out of his will. Yeah. You can do things that aren't sin, but it's not God's perfect will for you. You need to find out what God's perfect right. will is. And that's, right. what's, that's, that's right. what's so insanely Yes, that's what drives uh, young Christians to insanity, because they're trying to find things that God isn't revealing. Yes? I think Friesen's terminology on this is much simpler, much clearer. His moral will is sovereign. Okay, that's a, you, that's a good word. Another word for decretive is sovereign. Uh, another, another for commands is moral. Decretive and, you know, decree and command sound synonymous. So... I mean, I, I know the difference you, you between You just the need two to evolve things. further into thinking like a Presbyterian, Dan. Then they will sound just, 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 it'll just warm your heart to think of the decretive and the preceptive will of God. Um, yes, yes. 
what God, God is permitting, but, but the, and you bring that up, but the confession is very careful to say what God permits is not by bare permission. So when we talk about God permitting, not talking about permitting the way we permit, where we shrug our shoulder and say, ah, oh, I guess I'll let that happen. That's not, that's not, we're talking about permission bound inextricably with purpose. So that permission needs to be understood as uh, purposed permission. Seeking yeah, yeah. Excuse me? He can decree trials, but we can't get yeah. the offer of evil. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Uh, when we pray, thy will be done, we're really just saying, thy precepts to be done. We're not really yes. Done. Yes, I mean, I don't need to pray for his decretive will to be done. That's going to be done. His sovereign will is going to be done. Uh, other questions? Joe. Well, trials are the next question. See if it, the, this answers your, what, you're try, what you're pointing to. Does God want his children to suffer? Um, the answer to that is, of course, you know, it's, it's, it sounds kind of cruel, but the answer is yes. Of course he does. Of course he does. James 1, uh, Romans 5, uh, Psalm 119, it was good for me that I was afflicted. Hebrews 12, the disciplining hand of God, does he want us to suffer? Yes, because it's by suffering that we are sanctified and very little sanctification takes place apart from suffering. So does he want, do we, do you mean, is he, you know, pleased that we suffer? No, it's not like he, something God gets off on and just delighted to see, ooh, I, let's, you know, the, the, I, I love to see my people suffer. No, um, we're not saying that. We're just saying that it is the will of God to use suffering to sanctify his people because there typically is no other way to sanctify them because we're just so stubborn and hard-headed we just won't learn until we get flattened by an affliction or suffering. So how, how, could we, how could we even begin to think of us not being within that confine of him wanting us to suffer if, in fact, he caused and decreed his own begotten son to suffer? Um, yes, did God, want, we could say, did God want Jesus to suffer? Yeah, yes, why? The greater good. That's, uh, that's the way that Christian theologians have been describing the problem of evil and suffering. Why does God allow evil and suffering for the greater good? Because through um, the entrance, oh, did we already get to this? The entrance of sin in the world means that we have a clearer display of all the attributes. If there were no sin and no evil, we would not know at, with the clarity that we do the love of God, the grace of God, because that's revealed in Christ. There'd be no Christ if there were no fall. So the patience of God, the kindness of God, the goodness of God, and the righteousness of God, the justice of God, the holiness of God, they all are on vivid display because of the fall and then re the redemptive response to the fall. Uh, what is the extent of God's uh, providence? Uh, it's all-encompassing, all-encompassing. Uh, what, um, what does the Christian view of God's interaction with the world, how does God's, uh, how does the, Christian view of God's interaction with the world differ from that of pantheism. So if you weren't here yesterday, we went over this. Pantheism confuses the creation with God. Deism separates God from the creation. So what Christianity teaches is God is imminent and God is transcendent. He is everywhere present, but not to be confused with the creation. And he is also transcendent above and beyond the creation. He is infinite and not to be confused with anything that is finite. He is wholly other. Catechism. How did God create man? Together, God created man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, with dominion over the creatures. All right. Very good. So we press on to the next section which is two weeks, we do two weeks now on the fall, the covenants, and Christ. All right, so question number one is, 
What do me, we mean by the fall of man? So when somebody just says, well, that goes back to the fall, what are we talking about? Right. The, the first sin, the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Humanity fell from the estate of innocence that characterizes his condition in the garden into a state of depravity, an alienation from God. So that is described, uh, chapter 6, 1, our first parents being seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan. So I pointed out yesterday, this is, in, this is crucial. According to the Bible, there's no defect in Adam. The, the, the stimulus for, for, um, uh, to, to sin comes from, some, from, from an influence outside of a Adam. It's not a de defect in his, his makeup. It's not an inherent weakness. So, so that, that point is being made by the fact that the temptation comes from, not from within, as it does for us, Jesus says of us, like in Mark chapter 7, that the problem is within. It's from within that come all of the adulteries and, and, and covetousness and all the rest. It, that all originates within our own hearts. With Adam, it, w it did not originate there. It originates with Satan, who tempts him. In eating the forbidden fruit, that is the fall. This, their sin, God was pleased, according to his wise and holy counsel, to permit, having purpose. So th there it is. There is the confessional balance, and uh, what I believe is the scriptural balance, is that he, he permits having purpose. So again, back to the previous statement, not by bare permission. That's, al that's already been indicated. It's not by bare permission that the sin takes place, the fall takes place. It is he permitted it, having purpose to order it to his own glory. So we don't, we're not dealing with plan B here. We're not dealing with God waking up and finding that a sin has taken place. And he's, you know, he's frustrated by that and he doesn't know what to do next. And so he, he comes up with another scheme. Uh, no, this is a part of the divine plan and purpose decree from the very beginning. It is wrapped up in that whatsoever comes to pass. What you just said would be like a dispensational view of sorts, wouldn't it? God's well, I think one of the, cr con one of the criticisms of dispensationalism, which we will eventually get to um, in further detail, but is that it doesn't understand the continuities. Everything's discontinuous. There's discontinuity only. And um, what we typically emphasize is, is, is con continuity. Um, by this is the second paragraph, by this sin they fell from their original righteousness and communion with God, and so became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the parts and faculties of soul and body. Um, all right, um, so that's first. Uh, why did our first parents sin, and was it God's will? So my answer to that, which I trust was yours as well, is, is it they sinned because of the subtlety, they were seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan. Not because of any inbuilt, built-in weakness or defect in the way that they were created. God created them with the capacity to sin and the capacity not to sin. Uh, so back in um, chapter 4, verse 2, or section 2, um, if we, four two. Having the law of God written in their hearts and power to fulfill it. Yeah, and that's, so that's this reference, 4-2, the, the law of God written in their hearts and the power to fulfill it, but their will was subject to change. I like the way it explained it in the Williamson book about the sin was before the action, just the, the idea that maybe what God told them wasn't the whole story. Yeah. You know, I thought it was biting the apple up until I read this, but it really wasn't. It happened before that. Yeah, but the kind of the problem is the confession says it was their eating the forbidden fruit. Yeah. It doesn't say it was their thinking about eating it. It says it was their eating it. So it's hard to parse that out. 
Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, I think that what, I think that the, uh, the wrestling that, that, that is described of Eve, um, you know, Eve, um, I, I think the first response of Eve says she's already halfway down the road. I mean, exactly where you say the sin enters in, I mean, that's only God knows that. Um, but when she says, we may, t- responds to uh, the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden even, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it. I think she's gone. God didn't say anything about touching it. So she's already bought into this idea that God is restricting us. He's holding us down. He's limiting us. He, won't, he went, won't let us have this. I mean, this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What's wrong with the knowledge of good and evil? Um, we need knowledge, don't we? Um, he should be letting us. He's holding us back. I think she's already bought into it. The serpent said, you will, you will not surely die, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and, the, you know, she's, she's gone. She's, uh, and that the tree was... Uh, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of good reasons for eating this. She's already bought the lie. So she's looking at God differently. God is an ogre. God is limiting us. God's holding us back. And uh, so she's, you know, she's seduced. Yes. Uh, maybe this wasn't your intent, but saying that it was the subtlety and temptation of Satan that caused him to sin kind of sounds like it's taking some of the blame off of them. Um, I mean, so they, they sin. Yes, yes, but why did they make the decision? And the only point we're making is that um, if there had been no serpent, there would have been no stimulus to sin, that that had to come from outside of them. Um, But because... Also, Eve was deceived, Adam sinned. There's some commentators that have said, it sounds like Adam's standing right there the whole time. Yeah. As soon as that snake started speaking, Adam should have chopped his head off. What about Satan, though? Like, was there some temptation? Snakes just Was Satan given some external temptation? Was Satan given some external temptation? Not that we know of. So, was there a defect in the angels? Well, they were subject to fall. I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer to that. The Augustine answer applies to this. You weren't here last night, right? No. No, Augustine was asked one of those troubling questions like what was God doing before he created the world and his answer was he was creating hell for people who ask awkward questions. <laughs> I, I wonder if there's some semantic range in that the word seduced in the fact that whether it doesn't seem to be explicitly saying that that there wasn't something does it say that there was nothing wrong with Adam and Eve before the, if they have the capacity to sin, whereas God doesn't have the capacity to sin. They have the capacity to change, whereas God is immutable. Yeah. So this is something that, this is a, a difference between the creation and, and the created. Yeah, so the, the, here's, here's the language. This is, is this 4.3 or 4.2? I've got 4.3 written down here. Anyway, having the law of God written in their hearts and the power to fulfill it, they could have resisted. And yet, under a possibility of transgressing, having left, having left to the liberty of, of their own will, which was subject unto change. So th- they, they had free will and l- liberty to, to partake or not to partake. They had the power to resist. Uh, they had the capacity to, to violate. And so that's why we said last night, this, this is last, these, these are the last people who ever had free will. Yeah, again? Uh, uh, well, and I think it says really... I'm not sure that the scriptures are really telling us much about at what point was the actual sin, and maybe that's not even the point of the text, but I think it does tell us something about who God is and how he immediately goes to Adam. Wherever the point of the sin was, he comes to Adam afterwards and says, you know, that is the, he was the man that was responsible and accountable, and it was at that point, which we're informed later in Romans 5.12, that it was one man who sinned. Right. Um, Right. Um, so cu- uh, this is, well, we have a chapter coming up where we're going to get further into this. Uh, well, the covenants. That 
Yeah, so that Adam is in a covenantal relation. He's the covenant head. He is the covenant representative of humanity, including Eve. So, uh, who kno you know, if Adam didn't sin and Eve did sin, what would have happened? I mean, who knows? We could speculate all day long. We'd go, go join Robert. In the <laughs> but but um, um, uh, uh, would he have destroyed Eve and created another Eve? I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. But the, 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 the decisive event is Adam. And that's why Romans 5 is all about Adam and not about Eve. Is that he was in the, he was in the covenantal head, he was the covenantal head of the human race. Eve was not. I mean, they were one flesh, so. Uh, yes, but his action was the decisive one. I mean, if, if she sinned, they were one flesh, but he didn't sin in her sin necessarily. <laughs> I mean, if he were, you know, on the other side of the garden and she went over and grabbed the fruit and ate it, um, you know, that would have been a different situation. That was her sin, not his sin. But that's not what happened. She influenced him. The, s the serpent s seduced Eve. Eve seduced the man. Hasn't happened since. Tomas. question that said in is defying the will of God or planning to defy the will of God and it seems like that there's sort of an implicit evil that's already in the garden because the serpent is there Yeah. but yet said in the world not even through Eve but through I mean so maybe that's just the covenant part but like there was all things very good and then the serpent was Allowed. Defying God's will. Allowed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Allowed to tempt them, to test them. So, this is a probationary period. This is a probation. There is a test going on here, a very deliberate test. And he fails the test. And back to Romans 5, Jesus passes the test. You know, he comes at the second Adam and is obedient where, at where, where Adam was not obedient. And so fulfills and, 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 and accomplishes what Adam failed to fulfill and accomplish on behalf of humanity. So he's the second, the second man, the second Adam. And the, in, in the language of Romans 5, it's by the transgression of the one and yet by the, the righteousness of the one that the many are made righteous. So again, back to the other uh, statement I wanted us to, to, to go back to, 5-4, that uh, uh, you know, the extent of providence, it, it extends it embraces everything um, and includes even the first fall and all other sins of angels and men are wrapped up in the will of God and, the per and, and what God permits, but the confession is careful to say, but that is not by a bare permission joined with a most wise and powerful bonding and otherwise ordering and governing of them to his own holy ends, which is to say, permits with purpose, and, and, that, and that's what we have here, permits with purpose. He permitted having purpose. All right, um, next question. Uh, what effect did the original sin have on our first parents, on the rest of humanity? Is it fair that we should be condemned for what Adam did? So. That you're, you're not going to find anywhere in all the, the confessional literature any, any, any more strongly stated expression of the consequences of the fall. Um, so that um, Adam and Eve became, de they, 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 they forfeited righteousness, they forfeited communion with God, they became dead in sin, wholly defiled in all parts and faculties of body and soul. So that's terrible, but then they being the root of all mankind, the guilt of this sin was imputed. So counted against the rest of us, and the same death in sin and corrupted nature. So two crucial words. What do we understand happened by the fall? Guilt and corruption. We are guilty because Adam was our representative and he sinned as our representative, and his, his guilt was imputed to us, but we also inherited a corrupt nature. 
And that was conveyed to all of their posterity, that's us, descending uh, from them by ordinary generation, by you know, the normal means of conceiving a child. From this original corruption, whereby we are utterly, just s saturate yourself in the beauty of the clarity of the expression here, utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good and wholly inclined to all evil, do precede all actual transgressions. What does it mean at the end by saying, do precede all actual transgressions? They arise out of this corrupt nature that we have. Our transgressions are an expression of our fallen nature, our corrupt, perverted, um, disabled, disposed, opposite to all good, inclined to all evil human nature. And out of that, we by nature just go out and we, we do the, the sinful, dark, evil things that we do. So, um, the impact on the rest of humanity should be summarized by guilt and corruption. Guilt and corruption. Uh, or, or you can argue you, you, penalty and power. We're under the penalty of sin, under the power of sin. Okay, four, define the following sin, original sin, original corruption, and actual transgressions. Uh, so, sin, I don't think you can prove on a catechism question. Sin, sin is any violation of or lack of conformity to the law. Transgression of or. Uh, sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. So it can be passive, it can be active. Failure to conform, to do what you're supposed to do, or uh, to have done that which you ought not to have done. But the prayer book confession, you know, says that um, quite beautifully. We have, we have uh, done those things which we ought not to have done and done those things which we ought not to have done. So uh, sin is, uh, is, is any... Um, lack of conformity unto transgression of the law of God. So we, we saw that, if you were there Sunday night, we saw that uh, Sunday night. So, you know, sin is anomia from 1 John 3. It is lawlessness. It is, a vial, it, it is defined by the law. That's why the Apostle Paul says, Romans 3, 20, I would not have known sin. It's through the, sin, through the law comes the knowledge of sin, then Romans 7, I would not have known sin. I wouldn't know sin to be sin, except it was by the commandment, you shall not covet. So that's sin. Only had one that he needed to follow. Yeah. Just one. Well, one negative prohibition. Right. He had to hmm? fill the earth and subdue it. He had to have dominion over it. Just one negative prohibition. He had positive commands. Right. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, exercise dominion over it. And a Sabbath, and, and, and a Sabbath command. So rest. Follow the, follow the pattern that God has established and, and, and rest. Uh, so the original sin then is is what? Adam and Eve. That's what they did. Original corruption is the consequence of that original sin. It results in the corruption of human nature. So think about it this way. Does it make a difference? Does it alter your nature when you indulge in a sin? So my argument would be, it, absolutely it does. So as an illustration, think about the person who takes, uh, pulls some money out of the uh, cash register. We still have cash registers, don't we? Yes. Um, so he pulls some money, he, 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 you know, he just t terrified one day, he looks around, pulls a couple dollars out of the cash register, slips in his pocket and goes home. He t gets home, he just says, oh, that was, boy, if I get caught doing this, he feels terrible about it, that was wrong, I shouldn't have done that. You know, a couple of days later, he says, you know, actually that was pretty easy. He goes back and does it again. He goes, a couple of days later, he goes back and does it again. Pretty soon, he's not feeling any guilt whatsoever about it. He's gone from having stolen to being a thief. Now it doesn't afflict his conscience at all. He's a different person than he was. So that's what happens with sin. Sin changes us. Did it change Adam and Eve? Well, the, yes, that it corrupted their nature. And they pass that corruption on to us. So the original corruption would be the corruption uh, that, that took place in the soul of Adam and Eve, which then is transmitted to us by ordinary generation, by the whole process of conceiving and birthing human beings. And then actual transgressions, that's what we do. 
right? Th now, those are the things that, uh, that, that we're responsible for that we actually do ourselves. Actual transgressions, our sins. Uh, Sorry, is that distinction between original sin and original corruption important? Because it seems like in the, in the larger catechism, it seems like it's using original sin in the same way you're describing original corruption. I, yeah, I think in popular usage, and, and you, you might be right, in the catechism, original sin uh, often comes to represent um, both of these. I mean, it, it comes to represent the original act and the, all the consequences of their guilt and corruption, the whole... Sometimes we refer to original sin meaning the whole complex of corruption and guilt that results from the, the original sin and we are tainted by, characterized by original sin. So yes, it's used that way popularly and I believe you if you say it's in the catechisms that way. All right, number five, does regeneration rid believers of the corruption of sin? Is the sin nature uh, eliminated? One. Uh, six five says, this corruption of nature during this life doth remain in those that are regenerated, and although it be through Christ pardoned and mortified, yet both itself and all the motions thereof are truly and properly sin. Uh, so they are dealing there primarily, I believe, with the left wing of the Reformation, the kind of Anabaptist uh, tradition, and there were a number of cultic, sectarian type groups that were um, are in England in the 1640s that were making claims um, of perfectionism. And that, that, is a, that is a heresy that has reemerged over the centuries again and again. Uh, and to, to give you an example, um, you know, Matthew's former Gordon, former Gordon Conwell student, well, well, before I got there, I just got a secondhand report of it, but there was a Wesleyan teacher at Gordon Conwell who announced to his class, it was an intercession class, so it wasn't permanent faculty, but who announced that he had not sinned in the previous 20 years. And so, the, so and, and the logic was, can you go a moment without sinning? And a lot of people are going to say, well, yeah, I can go a moment. Well, how about two moments? How about three moments? How about ten moments? How about a hundred moments? How about a thousand? How about a million moments? And he said, of course, you have to redefine sin as conscious acts. So that would be part of it. But he said that he had not sinned in 20 years. He defined sin as conscious acts. He had not consciously sinned in 20 years. So what were all, wi all of us smirking when we heard that story? You've just borne a false witness. Uh, <laughs> I wonder what it was. Yeah, that's exactly. to be without sin, the truth is not in you. Yeah, we said, let's go ask your wife. Let's ask his wife whether or not he's ever s sinned in the last 20 years. Yes. Um, I, had, I was teaching a class of church history, and we talked about um, perfectionism. And I had a student who was a, with the Nazarene denomination. And he told me that in order for him to be ordained as a pastor, he had to claim that he had the second blessing and had experienced perfection. And I said, really? So what, what happens? He said, well, mostly we just lie. That's a great story. Um, be, I think the, probably the greatest American theologian, well, probably Jonathan Edwards is the greatest. I think the second was B.B. Warfield. And he devoted the last, I don't know how many years, 10 years of his life to writing over 1,000 pages on the problem of perfectionism going especially deeply into the whole German pietistic and then very liberal tradition and, um, and this, this, uh, this enduring concept that, that Christians somehow can live without sin. In spite of 1 John 1, 9, which was just quoted, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Uh, so this is, um, um, there's a, a certain um, realism, I think, in the Reformed tradition about what we can expect as Christians. Can I expect to ever be utterly free from sin? And the answer is no. You are in a fight. You are in a battle um, from the day that you were born again to the day that you die. You need to put on the full armor of God. You need to buffet your body and make it a slave. You 
need to mortify the flesh and its lusts, uh, crucify it. Uh, that's the language of the New Testament. Yeah, e eternal vigilance is required of Christians because there, there's always uh, the potential of, of the lust of the flesh to overtake us once again. It remains within us. There's the old man and then there's the new man and the old man is still there. And you're not going to get rid of them in this world. Yes? So in light of statement four and five, how are we to properly understand the good that the regenerate man does? Is it considered? All of grace. It's all of grace. Yeah. Yeah. All the bad is from me. All the good is from Christ. Yeah. On, on uh, corruption, if you want the, some of the biblical text, which I trust that you do, Romans 3 um, is the classic text. Uh, the Apostle Paul building this argument for the universal problem of sin. And, you know, the, the, it's, uh, he's just categorical about it. There's none righteous. Uh, did you miss the point? No, not one. Um, there's no one who understands. There is no one who seeks for God. Uh, you thought, well, you know, if anybody is seeking for God, it's because God has already initiated um, that desire in them. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good. He says it yet again. Not even one. Um, and then the, um, the, the, the climax of the argument in verse 19, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped. That you know, I, I, wish I, I wish I'd use that verse some Sunday night because that really is the goal of the building argument from Romans 1 in the pagan world and Romans 2 in the Jewish world. Um, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, but his point is that every mouth may be stopped. Nobody has any basis to brag about anything, to, to boast of their or claim their own righteousness, their own right standing with God, their own goodness. No, the, the result of the Biblical understanding of the fall and, and our corruption and our guilt is that our mouths should be shut um, from all false claims of our own righteousness and shut from all excuses the what we might make for our transgressions. Our mouth is just shut like Job, you know, at the end of Job. I close my mouth, put my hand over my mouth lest I blaspheme. Um, uh, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile toward God. All right, so uh, the, uh, the human condition by nature is what? It's one of hostility. It does not submit to the law of God. Indeed, it cannot. It doesn't, ha it doesn't have the capacity to please God, to obey God, to, um, uh, to serve God. Um, uh, continuing, I just think it, it helps, you know, to, to hear the biblical language. Um, Colossians uh, one twenty one, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. That's the way, just the way he characterizes life apart from Christ, life apart from God. What, what characterizes it? Oh, you were alienated and you were hostile in your mind, hostile toward who? Hostile toward God. And you were doing evil deeds. That was your life. Um, Genesis 6, 5, uh, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. with not uh, not that you know formerly you were alienated in enemies but God has now made you perfect um, it says yet now hath he reconciled he's reconciled us to himself it doesn't mean that in this life we've been made uh, made sinless so no we've just been made we've been reconciled to him. so as for guilt uh, uh, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and, through, and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. So death, uh, you know, the wage of sin is death. Uh, the guilt of Adam is visited upon us and the evidence of that, the expression of that is death. Not just corruption, but death. The guilt um, is traced back to the one man from Adam. All this has resulted. 
uh, verse 18 of, of Romans 5, therefore as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. Again, there's the guilt being, he is acting as our, as our, as our covenant head. He is our representative before God. He came under condemnation, we came under condemnation. It's, a, it's, it's like, um, okay, December, what is it, 9th, 1941, uh, wrote, 7th is the attack, 9th is the declaration, I think it was Tuesday, uh, it might have been Monday, but anyway, um, we declare war, uh, the Congress declares war, we all go to war, <laughs> right? The entire nation goes to war, our representatives make a decision, the decision then is, uh, impacts all of us. So we're used to a representative re uh, relationship. You know, they pass Obamacare, you know, it becomes the law of the land. They, 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 um, we have a re this representative form of government. And so what they, what they uh, decide, we, we in, through them decide with them. They go to war, we go to war. And uh, Adam went to war, he took us with him. Yes. Um, in this Romans 5.12 verse, do we see uh, an example of original and actual sin where it says just as sin came into the world through one man being the original sin uh, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, the act would that be the actual sin or are they both original sin? Yeah, does this mean that because all sinned in Adam or does it mean because all then... Uh, committed their own subsequent sins. Yeah, uh, yeah that's a good question. I, th I think you'll find it, uh, commentators go both ways. Yeah, either it. is correct, and both are correct. You know, yeah, the yeah they both are correct. I mean, ultimately, yeah. th they're both, they both are correct. Um, but you would think in terms of the argument, it would be all sinned in Adam. I think that that suits the argument, but I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want you to bring your commentary and somebody smarter than I am who says the opposite. Okay, the Savoy Declaration, can, do any of you remember what the Savoy Declaration is? Congregationalists, Congregationalists um, slight alteration of the Westminster Confession, which then gets slightly altered further on the sacraments by the Baptist. But the Savoy adds this language um, to this uh, this chapter, God having made a covenant of works in life thereupon with our first parents and all their posterity in them, they being seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan, did willfully transgress the law of their creation and break that covenant in eating the forbidden fruit. They being the root and by God's appointment standing in the room and stead of all mankind, the guilt of this sin was imputed. Uh, it's, a, it's a little clearer, you know, frankly, than Westminster as for this uh, re representative uh, stature, which we're, go we're, going to, we're going to get into that further in a, in a moment here. Um, Terry, can we, can we come back just for one minute to the question on is it fair? Is it fair that God put Adam as our fitting? Yeah, I wish you would answer that. Don't <laughs> well, <you. laughs> I, what, what is, what is it? to me is no one ever asks is it fair that Christ stood in our way to be kind of condemned. Yeah. They only think, oh, it's not fair that I have to, yeah, but it, I really love the fact that Jesus is my fair man. Yeah, right. So you're, you have it both ways. You're, yeah, you're anticipating what we're going to see in chapter 7 of the confession, uh, God's covenant with man. Um, you're, you're fine, Matthew. It's, uh, but, but yes, I mean, uh, th that it, we're, it cuts both ways. If Adam is a representative, uh, and that's not fair, then as Christ stands as our representative in our place, in our stead, that wouldn't be fair either. Unless there's some basic justice in a representative, represent representational kind of relationship. Um, it, it, it does, it cuts both ways. Uh, why, did the, why did they feel like they needed to add that to the Savoy Declaration? Um, they, I, you know, I can just, Guess they didn't. They didn't think there was enough clarity in it. So uh, might they? Might the men who in the Savoy Declaration have been part of the Westminster Divine? Some of them were. Oh, uh, John Owen and Thomas Goodwin were part of the Savoy revisions. 
they were the, the independents who tormented the Presbyterians at right. Westminster. So not, not getting exactly what they wanted at the Westminster yeah. Assembly, they tweaked it once they got right. out. Right, right. 1658, they came up with their, their own. They perfected the work of the Westminster divines. The, um, though in this regard, the change is entirely consistent. It is. Westminster doesn't put that text there, but what they're saying is entirely yes. in the spirit. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, does regeneration rid believers of the corruption of sin? No. Is the sin nature eliminated? No. It has to be mortified, and that's a lifelong process. You will never be free from the problem of sin. You can, um, you can mortify it and put it to death. You can get victory but you will always be in a fight. All right, to number six, what are the consequences of one and every sin? Well, here's what the confession says. This corruption of nature during this life doth remain in those that are regenerated. Whoops, number six. Every sin, both original and actual, being a transgression of the light, righteous law of God, and contrary thereunto doth in its own nature bring guilt upon the sinner, whereby he is bound over to the wrath of God and curse of the law, and so made subject unto death with all miseries, spiritual, temporal, and eternal. Um, so back to questions four and five. Uh, couple of other passages you may want to ponder. Um, uh, James 3, 13 through 17, let no one say any is tempted. I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So contrasting this about us with Adam, we are, we are enticed by our own desire, uh, which, which certainly the devil aggravates, presents opportunities, but there's, a, there's traction in our souls in a way that was not true with Adam. This desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown. Uh, th then there's Jesus. This is also Mark 7. Out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, and so on. Um, as for the remaining corruption, uh, Romans 7, um, you see the Apostle Paul. I believe as a, as a believer is wrestling and, and, and for me, for me, I was reading this passage, Romans 7, as a college student, um, and I was reading it in a booklet that was uh, printed, uh, published by Campus Crusade, in which they were arguing that the problem, this was, this was Paul before he was a believer, and uh, that uh, this problem then was solved by becoming a believer and being filled with the Holy Spirit. I read it, and uh, even though I had a, a, a you know a 19-year-old brain, f a mind full of mush, I, I knew instinctively this was describing me as a believer. Excuse me. A new perspective on Paul has been around for a while. Well, I don't, uh, do they? Do they? I don't even know. They, they have also a. Also argue that this was really yeah. Pretty yeah. Pretty yeah. I forget, I forget who it is, but one of the commentators on Romans, and it might be F.F. F. Bruce, who said that uh, when a new, pu new Romans uh, pu uh, commentary comes out, and he opens right to Romans 7 and then reads, uh, if, he, if the commentator handles this as the statement of a Christian or as the statement of a non uh, pre-Christian, and if it's pre-Christian, he closes it up and puts it up and doesn't look at it again. He thinks if he got that wrong, he's going to get lots of things wrong and not bother with it. So, so Paul says, I know the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. So it is no longer I who do it, but that sin dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. So here's where it really began to resonate with me as a college student. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. I find, I, I find it to be a law that I want to do right, but evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see my members in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in, in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? And then he, then he says, well, thanks be to God um, for the progress that he's made, but it, he's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a wrestling match. It's a battle. It's a fight. 
uh, Galatians 5.17, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Terry, if they're saying where it says, I have a desire to do what is right, I, um, I delight in the law of God, if they're saying that is a non-Christian saying that, then they're, they're denying uh, total depravity, aren't they? They're, 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 they're saying it's, it's quite possible for the pre-Christian to desire to do what's right, to love the law of God. You may be That's talking true. about Paul as in his position as Pharisee because he was exposed to the scriptures and could have, in fact, you know, loved studying those. Perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I... Uh, desire to do what is right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, I, I, yeah, I mean, you'd have to... I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't get there to say this is, this is somebody who is not a believer. I, this delight, I delight in it. I have the desire. Um, I can see Paul as a Pharisee saying that, but I can't see Paul as a Christian saying that of Paul as a Pharisee. Yeah. yeah. Heard what? A total, total depravity? Is that a broadly Christian idea or mostly like open? Uh, I think the first great theologian associated with it is Augustine, so that's fourth century. So there's the whole Augustinian tradition, which is in Roman Catholicism, and Luther was an Augustinian, and all of the Protestant reformers would have identified themselves as Augustinians. They didn't call themselves Calvinists, they called themselves Augustinians. So then if somebody were to take this as um, something that's like a, a, a pre-saved Paul saying this, if somebody said that then it would, it would go against total depravity. That, that, that's why I asked that, because it sounds like if they were to take that position, then they wouldn't believe in total depravity. Correct. Maybe it's not. So, so yeah, what Frankie is saying is that a, a person who is, an, is still unregenerate is not capable of saying, and Paul as a Christian is not capable of saying of his previous life that he had the desire to do what is right, that he delighted in the law of God and his inner man, that he was waging war against the law and so forth. That that's, that's the description of somebody who loves righteousness and hates every form of evil. You know, not somebody who doesn't yet know that, you know, the law says you shall not covet and he doesn't, isn't aware that he's a coveter. Yeah. I, uh, I, I heard a rumor that I'll be shortly staring down the barrel of some unconscious bias training at the company that I work for. And I, uh, I suspect that I'm going to hear a version of Romans 7 where there is a law proposed that is spiritual and our flesh is broken and uh, it's no longer I who do it but my own just bias that's within me and uh, I think this sounds exactly like something that we hear from the world I think the distinction is that of course we've got the wrong they've got the wrong God and they've got the wrong understanding of man they've got the wrong understanding of who God is they've got the wrong understanding of morality but I think yeah, it, I think I think the whole the whole the whole ruse is being ripped off from Romans 7 I think this is exactly what I think this is exactly what what I'm going to hear. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Um, all right, so um, the Galatians 5.17, the war of the flesh against the spirit. Um, uh, then the, we already cited 1 John 1, 8 through 10. Uh, but then as to what every sin deserves, question 6, uh, these are crucial texts to be aware of. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point. There, there's the standard. That's where the bar is set. You, you fail in one point, you, are, you have become guilty of all of it. Uh, the same thing in Galatians 3.10, whoever, uh, for all who rely on works of the law are under curse, for it is written, cursed be, every, be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. If you're going to go by law, you got to keep the whole law. You stumble at a point, you fail at any particular, you are under condemnation and lost. Yes, William. Um. Maybe jumping ahead a couple of weeks, but are we going to painstakingly go over the 
nature change that comes with the Holy Spirit, the redemption that comes in Christ? We will get there. We are laying the foundation for getting there. There's a whole chapter on uh, effectual call, regeneration, and so forth. Yes, you may read ahead if you'd like to see. Because this, 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 it's a lot of, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. Yeah. And we are, but it's, I think, easy, especially for maybe younger believers, to hear that and, and, and forget about what comes from the gift that we have accepted. Yeah. I think the divines want to make sure you understand because I, don't, I think they're convinced that maybe we're not, con uh, that most people are not convinced. We're bad, we're bad, we're bad, we're bad. I think that, you know, the modern lingo, you know, I'm okay, you're okay. Um, and if you go to the average man on the street, now I, I think 99 out of 100, maybe 999 out of 1,000 will say, if you ask them if they're going to go to heaven, they say they will. Why? Because I'm a good person. That's, I mean, that's the default, that's the default of, of basically paganism, is that I will get to heaven because I'm a good person. And so, yeah, the point is, is, is being labored in this section. Yes? How do we then um, ever comment or try and help somebody else? Uh, how do we talk to them about what sin is and being sinners? You, you know, I, I, I feel really kind of, I, I can't point out somebody else's. I don't know their heart or stuff like that, and, and I am still a sinner more often than I'd like to be. Um, you know, it, it, that dichotomy of do I, have a, do I have a log in my eye and I'm pointing out somebody else's fact um, really makes it hard to determine that, you know, let, I'm not going to be the guy that throws the first stone. You know, um, how, do you, how do you help other people I have a lot of friends that say they're Christians, but they don't go to church. You know, they don't read the Bible. They don't believe the Bible. They pray when they're in trouble. I, I would like to help them understand more, but I, I, it's like, I'm not. And they won't come to church. Let me just say that, because that was my out. Just bring them here and let somebody else tell them. You know, how do you, how do, you do that? So let's take a break now, and Frank, you'll answer that question. Okay. <laughs>